and I am uh, the curator of the exhibition Ecofeminisms, which is now on view at Thomas Urban Gallery. The exhibition opened in, in June and we hoped, uh, we originally, well, originally we planned to open it at the beginning of May. Uh, but uh, life checked and changed our plans. We opened it in June. It was supposed to stay there for a, for a month, but there was an incredible interest in these ideas, how and where feminism and interest in ecology cross paths and what the result might be. And therefore the exhibition has been extended. It is still uh, in, uh, in the gallery. You can go and see that at, in, at Thomas Urban Gallery in Chelsea. Uh, for all those who are not willing to go out and risk or don't want or can't, uh, the gallery, the, uh, the exhibition is quite well documented online. You will find a gallery walkthrough of my commentary. You will find the essay, all the images, and also all the conversations that we recorded so far with the artists. Tonight, uh, we have very special guests. Uh, we could not invite the artists because these two artists uh, passed away a long time ago. Uh, but we have with us uh, the niece and goddaughter of Anna Mendieta, Raquel Cecilia, and we have the daughter of, uh, daughter of uh, Bilga Friedlander, Mira. And I'm very excited for this conversation because the format will be a little, a little different. We will talk about, the art, about art, but we will also talk about uh, how they themselves worked with those, have worked with those legacies and with passing uh, them down. Uh, normally, you know me, everybody who show, saw our conversations before, I never read anything. I prefer to speak because it's more, more lively, but we have a lot of visual material today. And I will be very much trying to be very much on point with time. So I will probably support myself a little bit with what I've written as, a, as an introduction. And, um, and we will show you now a few images from the gallery so that you can get a little bit accustomed to how the exhibition looks like. We have 56 Participants. I'm sure more people are trying to join in, but uh, we, will, we will first do this walkthrough and that will uh, allow two more people to join and then I will introduce to you officially Raquel and Mira. So the exhibition was uh, uh, conceived not, not as a survey, not as something complete or finished. It's, it really is not a very big gallery, uh, but it is supposed to be a research project and uh, the results surpassed our expectations. And really, it's, it's, it's very much spearheaded new research and new, new exchange among scholars on, on this topic. So my original question was whether the term ecofeminism is a historical term or could it really be applied to art made today? We have to understand that the situation of women today, 50 years after the early feminist artworks were created, uh, is quite different, uh, both uh, in the art world and um, in, uh, socially in general. And that the definitions of gender uh, changed radically. And um, the whole question which is so central for ecofeminism, which is about the dualism between male and female element or uh, traditional gender roles is not really, uh, cannot really be seen in the same light. This has to be seen through historical lenses today. But I always say, as long as our language uh, remains gendered and it does remain gender across the globe pretty much in most cultures and we say mother nature and we say mother earth that as long as we do that it makes sense to ask questions why and what does it mean for women uh, I have to say that there is enormous literature on ecofeminism as philosophy or as activism but very little literature on ecofeminist art it is dispersed it's dated um, uh, there's a lot to be done uh, in this segment and also the art is very little known. Uh, I did not even understood how little it is known until I did this show. So not to get, get into the definition, which I avoid to give because I think that artists also resent it. Um, I will tell you what I found typical for um, ecofeminist works and these will be our roadmap for the conversation. I found four elements which repeat in almost every of those early ecofeminist artworks, which were made between 1970s, early 1970s and early 1990s. The first of them is the foundation in feminist spiritualism, which proposed to end the dualism between nature and culture or civilization, between body and mind, mind between male and female elements and traditional gender roles, 
And artists inspired by feminist spiritualism often employed ritual performances, often private, centered around the ideas of life cycle or healing. Therefore, you will see a lot of performance uh, uh, among like, uh, feminist pro projects. Understanding that the abuse of women, native people, and nature are all grounded in the same patriarchal philosophy and religion. And that is really early on in 1970s. Uh, to think that we didn't listen to these women is is problematic. The third element is radical opposition to painting, typical for all conceptual art. In this case, here it was motivated by the rejection of women by the art market and inspired by, or maybe grew into, ecological consciousness and the effort of making art from natural materials that could decompose and disintegrate back into nature, like in the case of Bilga Friedlander. Similarly, almost all, all ecofeminists spoke against monumentalism and made works in landscape that left no or minimal footprint, or that are cultivation projects. Unlike land art created mostly by men, which altered land and required heavy machinery. And this led to the fourth point that I want to make, to radical abandoning the tradi of traditional art spaces. Ecofeminists, especially those working with wastes and wastelands, and Lucy Lipar named them uh, garbage girls. I love this expression. It's uh, really radical what they proposed. They were among the artists who pushed the limits of the definition of art the farthest and proposed the most radical art forms, in my opinion. And I mean here such artists as Mir Lukalis, Aviv Rahmani, Betty, Betsy Damon, uh, Patricia Johansson, um, uh, Betty Beaumont, we can, the list is really much longer than you can see in the exhibition. So without much further ado, today we will discuss two artists whose works differ in medium, in aesthetics and prominence. Anna Mendieta, 1948-1985, is probably the best, the most widely recognized feminist artist, while Bilga Friedlander, 1934-2000, has been largely forgotten. Despite these huge differences, there are striking parallels between the two works in the exhibition. Could we see them, Tyler? Yes, not only did both artists insist on leaving minimal footprint, Anna working with landscape and Bilga through the use of natural materials and designing packaging for her foldable installations in order to limit storage space. They both contributed to spiritual feminism, but not through seeking a universal female goddess, which Mendieta directly opposed as a practice of white feminism, but through seeking their own roots in cultures which formed them, Cuban and Turkish. Both works mark their returns to the artist's homelands in the search of self and Mother Earth, Anna from a painful exile, Bilga from a voluntary emigration. The resulting works are different, also because of the vastly different ways and reasons why they left their countries. Both artists passed away and cannot join our conversations, but left us with their writing, which is uh, direct guidance for us to access this work. And we have two uh, guests that I have mentioned already, Anna's uh, niece and goddaughter, Raquel Cecilia Mendieta, and Bilga's daughter, uh, Mira Friedlander. And these women's own journeys into the past, into the footsteps of uh, great artists who are also, they are very close family members, are um, worth uh, our question, our uh, asking questions about it and they are fascinating stories in themselves. So Raquel traveled to Cuba to find out whether one of the sites uh, where Ana Mendieta worked, which was believed to be destroyed, could still be found wrote an essay for the exhibition last year at Gallery Le Long, La Tierra Habla, a fantastic essay. That's, that was the moment when I was reading it, when I thought, uh, I would like to meet you, I would like to hear more. Uh, it added so much to the perspective of scholars. It's just such a different point of view. And I thought it was brilliant that you decided to include it in the, in the catalog. And uh, she did a documentary, Whispering Cave, now working on a, on a larger document, documentary on, on Anna. Uh, Mira, uh, organized her mother's archive fair, first as her own conceptual project as an artist uh, when she was in residency at Recess in New York and then co-curated Bilga, Bilga's posthumous exhibition at Artaire in Istanbul in 2016. The role of family ties, sometimes sacrifices, is a subject worth speaking about in the context of how we pass women's legacy on. 
So without further ado, let me introduce uh, Raquel and let me first read a uh, very short bio of Anna so that we're all on the same page and with the same access uh, to facts. Anna Mendieta uh, was sent to the US as a child in 1961 as a result of her father's political engagement. Her work, haunted by the exile's sense of displacement, explored themes of feminism, ethnic identity, violence, life, death, place, and belonging. At its core laid the use of her body. She was possibly the first to combine the land art, body art, and performance in what she called earth body sculptures, Silhouetta series, which she developed between 1973 and 80. Since her death, Mendieta has been recognized with retrospectives at the New Museum, 1987, uh, Hirschhorn Museum, Whitney, Des Moines Art Center, Miami Art Museum, all of them in 2004, Howard Gallery in London and Castello di Rivoli in Turin in 2013. Her experimental films garnered critical acclaim with the traveling exhibition covered in time and history, shown among others at the UC Berkeley Art Museum, Martin Gropis Bau in Berlin, and Jean de Pomme in Paris. Between 2015 and 18, Mendieta's works are in the collections of the Guggenheim Museum, Metropolitan, Whitney Museum, MoMA, Art Institute of Chicago, Saint Pompidou and Tate. And that probably is a good moment for me to say how grateful I am to Galerie Le Long, uh, which uh, made all of, a lot of this possible. And which is a stellar, which is really am amazing steward of that legacy and makes it uh, for researchers and scholars like me available and uh, available for the exhibitions. And I've, I've been extremely grateful for, it's the second time that we work together. Uh, Raquel. Raquel Cecilia Mendieta is a filmmaker, writer, and video artist most known for her recent films on her aunt, aunt, artist Anna Mendieta. Her films have screened at film festivals and art museums worldwide. She is the associate administrator for the Estate of Anna Mendieta collection and was responsible for overseeing the digital restoration of the artist's works on film and video. She's currently working on a feature length documentary about the life and art of Anna Mendieta. Raquel, could you talk to us, could you introduce the work that is in the exhibition for, for everyone? Sure. So the work that is in this exhibition is titled Bakayu, which is a, a name of a goddess um, from a Cuban legend. So Ana did several pieces in Haruko, in Haruko, Cuba, in a park. And it's a very jungle-like park. Um, and she found these kind of grotto-like caves where she did her, her sculptures there in two different sites. So Bakayu is one of the first ones that she did. Um, you can see that it's like um, a piece of the cave of the, the limestone that had fallen. And instead of, you know, chipping away at it, she really used what, had, what was already there and shaped it to be like one of these um, goddesses, you know, one of these figures that she would do and then painted to outline the form. You see the head and then the breast and then it goes down to the torso and into a point. Um, and it's, it's interesting because there are two different sites and at this particular site, the limestone is much harder. And so she really was looking for shapes that were already in the landscape, that were in the rock that she could further make into one of her, you know, into one of her forms, that she, into one of the types of sculpture she was making. And then the second site was a much softer limestone and was, had like a pink hue to it. And so there she actually carved and chiseled the shapes. So there are two very different types of sculptures in these two different sites. So this one, Bakayu, is light of day. Um, she named these after, after the fact. She was very interested in um, Taino legends and Cuban legends. And this particular one, Bakayu, comes from a Cuban legend um, from, from a book that she had. And she just, you know, gave them these titles. Can we see the next image? Yeah. So this is Anna. Um, so she did these, these works in Haruko in the summer of 1981. And then that same year in the fall, she had an exhibition at her gallery. She was part of the AIR gallery in New York City. And she printed them. She had a medium size uh, format camera, a Mamiya. And that's how she documented the, the sculptures. And so she took photographs of them, she took Super 8 uh, black and white film of them, and then she had this exhibition in November of 1981 where she, here she is standing next to um, one of the pieces, Guaban Sex, 
um, as she's talking because she was always talking. So there's not very many pictures with her mouth closed. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, you know, she was very proud of these works. You know, she felt like this was an exhibition that finally, you know, the works were present in the gallery space because before that she was printing them smaller because she didn't have that camera. So she wasn't able to enlarge them. Um, and so this was the first time that she was really able to present them. And she felt that you, when you came up to the photograph that you felt like you were entering the site, you know? So she had, she had several of these in, in the gallery space. And when you came up to them, it was almost as if um, you were there, you know, looking at one of the sculptures in Haruko. And it's a very short period of time, right? She did them in July and in November already, she showed them in New York City. Yes, very quick turnaround. Um, do we want to show a little bit of the, of the film that you shot? Sure. In 1981, my aunt, artist Ana Mendieta, was the first Cuban exile to be given permission to create works of art on the island. Ana chose a park 20 miles from Havana in Haruko called Escaleras de Haruko. Escaleras means stairs because of the step-like qualities of the limestone and dolomite rock formations. She chose this location due to its history that dates back to the Taino Indians and to the rebels fighting in the war for independence in the late 1800s. She chose these caves in Haruko to add her story to theirs. Anna carved a series of sculptures in two different locations in the park. According to her Cuban colleagues, the carvings were destroyed at one of the sites when the porous rock was quarried for use as a construction material. So that's a little bit uh, from, from your film. Do you want to add anything? Sure, so that's, I mean, I don't want to take too much time, but so basically um, I had been to Haruko in 2015 and went to the one site that everyone knew existed because a lot of people had been there and you know, so the people know where it is. And when I was there, I recognized the landscape from one of her Super 8 films because I, at the same time I had been restoring her Super 8 films and that's, you know, when you're doing that, you're watching the material a lot, you know, over and over again. So when I was there and I saw this landscape, it hit me, wait, that looks like this one that they're saying is destroyed. And so it took two years to get back to, and I decided, oh, I'm going to shoot something and see if I, what I find. And that resulted in this documentary. So. We'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, Bilge Friedlander graduated from the Istanbul Academy of Fine Arts in 1958 and earned her MFA from the New York University in 1959. Her career took off with exhibitions at Betty Parsons Gallery in 1974 and Kuhn Gallery in 1976, both reviewed in the New York Times. She exhibited at the UMCA in Amherst, Massachusetts, 1977, Papa, in other words, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in 1981, and Jessica Berwind Gallery in Philadelphia in 1993. Gallery Neve in uh, 94, and Erkument Kalmik Museum 98 in Istanbul. She also participated in the second International Istanbul Biennial in 1989, the International Biennial of Paper Art in Duren, Germany in 92, and group shows at the Museum of Modern Art in Kyoto, American Craft Museum in New York, and Borussen Art and Culture Center in Istanbul. In 2016, a major solo posthumous exhibition, Words, Numbers, Lines, debuted at Arter, Istanbul. Friedlander was a professor at Tyler School of Art and, and the University of Pennsylvania. After 38 years in the United States, in 1996, she returned to Istanbul, where she died in 2004 years later. Mira Friedlander, her daughter, is an artist living in New York City and has exhibited locally and internationally. Her work has been featured in the New York Times and BOMB, and she is a recent fellow in the Art and Law Program and has held public facing residences at the American Center in Bangladesh and recess in New York City. She's the director of the Bilga Friedlander Estate and co-curated Bilga Friedlander words, non words, numbers, lines at Arter in Istanbul in 2016. Mira, to you. Um, thank you, Monica. Um, okay, so the work that's in the show is called Cedar Forest and these are nine freestanding handmade, uh, handmade paper sculptures. They're made out of linen fiber, flax, 
and these were made in 1989. They're about 30 inches high, and they're meant to be uh, installed in such a way that the viewer can walk among them. Um, and they're very variable, and uh, they nest inside each other when they're in storage. So these were made um, during a period where my mom was investigating the Epic of Gilgamesh, and she, which is one of the oldest epics that comes down to us. And a part of a larger installation that includes um, monotypes and etchings and a leaf d'artiste um, called Windows for Gods and Goddesses, and also Burning Logs, also referring to the forests that were destroyed in the epic, but also our ecological disaster that we're still living through. And then there was another group of works from this period called um, Tools and Offerings, which were marble or bronze um, sand circles. Um, and you'll see images of the expanded installation later. Um, and my mother actually in, uh, so this was shown in 89, um, and she continued in this vein. And um, in 98, she uh, had an artist talk where she talked about this work. And I'd like to read her own words describing her engagement with this, this work and this myth. So this is translated from the Turkish um, in dial from an artist talk with Zeynep Rona in Istanbul. Around 1987, I re-encountered Gilgamesh, and in response, I made my installation for the second International Istanbul Biennial in 1989. Gallery Nev produced a leaf d'artiste of original etchings for Gilgamesh. I had encountered a mythology that belonged here, belonged to the Middle East, and moving from that, I made this work and brought this mythology back here. The space should be used in such a way that it is possible to enter the work and wander around in it so that one becomes part of the myth. The legend is very long, so I only took two parts. The first is the story of the cedar forest, and the second one is of the goddess with two names, Inanna or Ishtar, a goddess I love. The 1989 exhibition included sculptures made of linen fiber as a symbol of the cedar forest. When you entered and walked around, you became part of them. And there was a part that was an offering to Ishtar Inanna. In our lives, ritual has close to no place whatsoever. It does not, even if it does, we are not aware it is a ritual as we're doing it. This installation also has a ritual side a circle and sand and marble forms on it, which you can see in this. These forms depict how Inanna is creative, reproductive, a part of nature. It is as if they all come from inside one another. I mean like opening up an onion. The black side shows the life and death duality. And there is a circle mound made with soil. Using soil as itself, I made an offering to Inanna. The green marble on it is another side of Inanna. The monotypes on the wall show the swathed, disappearing part of a burnt tree and depicts how we are losing forests. Because Gilgamesh cuts down the cedar forest, and at the time of the epic, the cedar tree is very precious. He says to Shamash, the sun god, if you let me accomplish this, I will raise a monument to the gods. And Shamash shows him mercy and says, go, cut cedar, sacred cedar forest, just like we do today. Inanna has a bull. It is a sacred bull. It has been given to her by her father, who tells her, here is this bull. Do whatever you will. In the legend, Gilgamesh kills the bull. There are many repetitions of this in our time. Why does Gilgamesh kill the bull? What does he want to accomplish by killing this bull? And that's from the Zeynep Rona Archive, interviewed June 9th, 98. It's quite amazing that we have the artist's words. I can only say for the curator, for the scholar, this is really everything. Um, it's the same, I think, for um, Anna. We have a lot of uh, quotes from her self and there is a lot of guessing what the works could actually mean. It's always very important to stick to what the artist actually said. 
um, by herself. So thank you very much, uh, Mira, for, for sharing this. And also it allowed us to show you in both cases, you know, the gallery will show an element, but artists usually um, works on, on the work within a cycle of something bigger, something wider, and we could present this way through your words, um, this context. So I wanted to ask you now about the language of expression. Both, the art, both artists are very different. And it's really exciting to have this comparison let's call it comparable study, which there is no comparison, but there are amazing similarities and points and, and differences, and differences are extremely interesting. So I wanted to ask you how in both, uh, in, in the case of each of them, nature and or ecology uh, influence them and how they change their language and develop their language of expression. Anna started as a painter, and she, you know, she started in art school, um, she got her undergraduate degree in painting, and then she start, She has a master's degree also in painting. And at that time, I mean, it was the 70s, and there was a lot of exciting things happening around her. And she was also very interested in primitive art, and in, um, she was very influenced by uh, Mexico. And she felt like her paintings, she said, they weren't real enough for her. They didn't have enough magic, any power in them. And that was right at the same time that she had discovered using her body, that that was kind of when performance art was really happening and she was starting to hear about it and learn about it. And she immediately switched to using her body. Um, and once she did that, it's kind of like her work completely opened up and she started using natural uh, materials, uh, especially after she went, you know, traveled to Mexico. She was very influenced by that and she felt a real connection to Mexico because it was like a um, kind of like a, an echo, you know, of her homeland of, of Cuba. And, you know, she had missed that. She had left when she was 12 years old, almost 13 years old. And here she was finally in a country where people looked like her, they spoke like her. Um, so it was like this very deep connection and her work, you know, really, it, you can see the magic in it. So um, the, here's a piece here that she did, um, a very well-known piece called Imagen de Yahul, which she did in an ancient site where she was naked and she lay in, a, in an ancient tomb and covered herself with flowers. And the idea was that she wanted to be um, covered, you know, covered by nature as if somebody would find her and find like a, you know, like when you go to an ancient site and you see like little shoots of flowers and things growing out of the, out of the rock. Um, and she actually thought of this piece as her first silhouette. So this is when her work really started to shift. And because um, she had been doing kind of some, you know, she, she continued with performance and using her body. And that's when she started uh, doing the silhouette. So the silhouette series, she would lay on the earth, um, typically on the earth, and use natural materials like flowers, um, grass, leaves. And, um, and it was, you know, her body, it was always like her, her body. And then she took her body out because she realized that by having her body in the image, the people were still looking at, oh, here's a woman, she's nude. And that's not what the work was about. For her, it was a much deeper connection. It was about a reconnection with the earth. It was about um, feeling like um, going back to her motherland and trying to find a place to belong because she felt, you know, that she had been torn away. She said, torn away from the motherland. Like she had been cast out of the womb. So this was like her way of, of reconnecting with that. So she took herself out of the image and created these beautiful silhouettes, um, such as this one. This is flower person, flower body. She did this piece um, in photographs and also as the Super 8 film where you can see this beautiful um, silhouette to float down the river in, in Iowa. And the, the shape just continued to evolve, you know, and she started, you know, she would do it in so many different types of natural elements in the dirt, in the ocean, um, in rock. She used fire, she used water, she started using gunpowder. This is a silhouette she did in Mexico with um, fireworks. So basically she had someone make her this bamboo structure. It's a, you know, it's a very Mexican tradition during um, celebrations. They make these, you know, usually for like Easter and holidays like this. Um, and she, you know, with, with the cross. And so she had the idea of putting it on a, putting her silhouette like that and putting it on fire. And this is also um, a Super 8 film and in photographs. 
Um, so she, she was very interested in fire. She was a very fiery person and she liked that things like, you know, exploded and, and she, she played with volcanoes and um, gunpowder. Um, and so then her work started evolving and becoming more um, like simpler forms, like so that it was still a human body. It was not really um, as female. It became kind of more universal, like she took the arms off. Sometimes, you know, you, you couldn't really tell if it really was a human or not. It became almost like these hieroglyphs, you know, like this own, her own language that she was developing. Um, this is a piece that she did called Isla. And it's in the mud in, a, in like a riverbank. And it's such, so beautiful because you can see the clouds reflecting in the, in the water. Um, so she, she said this was kind of like a, a theme that she had, you know, she did the island theme, she did the tree of life themes. So she had these recurring themes in her work, but they all were rooted in nature. Um, I actually also have a quote from her. I was going to read something that she wrote that I find very beautiful. Um, she said, my art is grounded in the belief of one universal energy, which runs through everything from insect to man, from man to spectra, from spectra to plant, from plant to galaxy. My works are the irrigation veins of this universal fluid. Through them ascend the ancestral sap, the original beliefs, the primordial accumulations, the unconscious thoughts that animate the world. There is no original past to redeem. There is the void, the orphanhood, the unbaptized earth of the beginning, the time that from within the earth looks upon us. There is above all the search for origin. So she, her, every single thing she wrote about her art had to do with nature. Everything was about nature, connecting to nature, finding yourself in nature, you know, the entire, I mean, this, this is like the entire universe, it's everything, you know, so it's, that's basically what her work is about. So. Thank you. Thank you for reading it. It's somehow, especially today, difficult to explain why spirituality would be a term that we would even bring up. Uh, but I was also surprised to find that for, for these artists at that time, this was really the key subject and the way they entered the, sub, the nature. And then from this, so many things started. All right. So speaking about um, my mother's relationship to ecology and nature, um, it's very important for her. And um, she was a very active person from a young age. I think she wanted to be a dancer before she wanted to be a visual artist. But she was always running, swimming, scuba diving. And she loved the physical act of drawing, which was part of her uh, education at the academy. So she came to the States in 58 to New York and she studied painting at NYU. And she came to be an artist, you know, capital A. Um, but she was very frustrated with painting and the canvas, and she was trying to find ways to push through it. Um, so I'll leave the biographical details for later, but um, so in, in the early 70s, where she's really coming into her own as an artist, she had this experience um, on the, in, in the Bahamas scuba diving on a wall at the tongue of the ocean. And this is over an abyss, a, a, a sea trench, where you dive down to 185 feet. Now these works are from 73, I believe. So this is after the, this experience I'm gonna describe, but she went down into the depths and she had this experience of no up, no down, um, and the spacelessness of space, which she wanted to get into her work and she wanted to depict and she just, could not make the canvas do it. So she, she said, you know, I'm, I reject painting. I reject this large um, monumental style of, of creating paintings, which was the thing at the time, and started engaging in the human scale within the human arms and with paper and with human perception of the horizon and gravity. Um, this experience of not having those feelings underwater really transformed her ideas and she took it back to the studio. So for years um, from 72 till 76, she's engaging in, um, you know, pushing this and in investigating the lifespan of the horizontal line and ex examining this horizon, this perception of the horizon as something that makes us human, 
that it's not something that exists without human beings. Um, and she felt the same about the square. And this was all very spiritual in a way, this connection with nature and with these two um, shapes. Um, I think you have another slide there. I don't know if you're, yeah, there we go. Um, so, so he, uh, from an early age, she is connecting with nature and trying to place human beings inside it, you know, and, and to, by exploring um, human perception and also through the mystical mathematics of nature, you know, um, the way that the waves hit the shore, um, the Vedic number systems, and, and the way the scale being inside a small scale that also expands to enclose the universe. So it's a very philosophical position for her. So in the mid 70s, so here's a great example of this perception and, and pushing the shape, uh, the, the, spa the, the, the space of the work as a place for us to enter into. Um, and so from the 70s into the later, late 70s, early 80s, she begins to work with more natural materials, leaving behind handmade paper that was commercially available. She starts making her own paper. She's working with beeswax, such as this sculpture, which is Heart's Nest. Um, and again, it's these, these materials of uh, beeswax and later flax, like in the Cedar Forest, they're almost immortal uh, materials. They're, and they are historical materials, and they're very strong and durable. So through the 80s, she's connecting with myth. She's connecting with um, feminist texts. She's reading a lot across, in, uh, across all kinds of um, uh, topics uh, and, in, and really doing a feminist investigation of Jungian archetypes, which is how she interacts with the Epic of Gilgamesh um, and going beyond it. So we have another quote that I think will, relates to this, um, which I'll read. Um, but that's just to say that her relationship with nature was a thread that goes throughout the, all the work, whether it's the 70s minimalist expressions, they are speaking about nature. And then later these more overt eco-feminist ones. So she says, and this is translated from the Turkish, I also have an ecological side. We live in a material world. Every artist makes thousands of works. Everyone wants their work not to vanish. We load and load the world. But what will this lead to? Why are we doing this? Aren't there enough museums? What do we want to say as artists of the present? What do we want to do? That's why I want some things to get larger and then smaller, hide in small places. For instance, the tiny chair sculptures, which were exhibited in a huge space, but they're stored in a tiny space. So is River House Book. The little boxes all went into one another and formed a block. That is to say, they also had a small house. She continues. Around 1983, major changes and crises took place in my life. Then I decided to go out into nature, but as always with a great fear, because when I go out into nature, my aim is not to make a big sculpture and put it in the middle of nature, but to engage with nature itself, to invite nature to a little dance. I thought this will heal me. I should have put it differently. Sure, I am always inside nature. I because I do works that are very closely linked to nature. I run, I swim, I dive. I am always at one with it. This is what I meant to say. How can I tangibly merge my art with nature? That's from the Zeynep Rona Archive, interview June 9th, 1998. There's so much more to say about that. Ah. <laughs> so um i wasn't expecting I, um so yeah and the, this is you know a piece from the late it was shown in 1990 um this this uh desire to use her work 
to heal. To go out in the tangible yes. in nature, right? Yes, yes, these were installed and she thought she'd be able to take these down when the show was finished. But of course they were infested with life. Um, so that didn't happen, but there are other works that relate to these. And these were the healing scrolls installed in uh, Fairmount Park in Philadelphia. Yes, and again, there are very interesting uh, stories about them in, in the diary. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting, it's a very important thing. It's fascinating uh, when you were speaking about the durability of those materials, but at the same time, these are ecological materials. So when we think of what can be done in the art world today in terms of you know, toxicity of, of, of what we all contribute to. It's very interesting to listen to this artist who is so aware of her choice of material back in 1970s, but at the, and at the same time, she still maintained object-based practice, right? We're not talking about social practice artists, but an artist who still produces objects. I, I find um, Mirka's work in that way not obvious, uh, unusual, different than other ecofeminists, and uh, it, it's, it is very um, inspiring, I think. Um, I chose those two works uh, to somehow touch a very problematic idea of goddess art, which has huge literature, but very dated literature, and by itself, it has many problems uh, in it, and I mean, I'll go into all of it, but it, it requires new scholarship and, and new uh, sorting this material out. But I found those two artworks, uh, by Anna Mendieta and by Bilga Friedlander, respectively, being a very interesting examples of something else, something bigger, that is pure a quest for feminist spirituality, but it doesn't lead to shallow ideas, but that really, um, you know, without easy symbolics leads us into nature and in, into those ideas of, of female empowerment. And when I did it, I thought that it was because of these two artists had roots elsewhere, uh, and they were not looking for the universal goddess uh, utopia, but they had something real in their own culture to refer to, whether through criticism or through embracing. I thought that this would be interesting to look at it. But then when the works were already in the gallery and I looked at them together, it was so striking to me that this is really uh, a hero, a, a heroine journey, journey in this case. And they both of this, these are the works that are created when each of them goes back after many, many years mm -hmm. and makes this reconnection and what that means, how, how fundamental these two works are for their um, uh, ever is just amazing. So I wanted to ask you about the meaning of this journey, respectively to Cuba and to Turkey. What did it mean for the artists, for their, um, for their, um, looking for their own identity, their own roots, their own culture, but also in this spiritual feminist quest uh, uh, for looking for women's empowerment. Could you discuss that? So Anna, as, as I was saying before, Anna was born in Cuba and she left her country when she was 12 years old, going on 13. She was, you know, she basically was forced. I mean, she said she was forced out of her country. I mean, really she was sent out of her country by her parents through um, something called Operation Peter Pan, which was set up through the Catholic charity. Um, they were bringing children to the United States um, because Castro had taken power and they were worried about what was gonna happen to these children. Um, and this is something that has happened, you know, many times before in Cuban history where, you know, a dictator or someone would come into power and, the, you know, the, the middle to upper class would send their children to Miami or somewhere else to Europe, you know, to study for a year or so until things kind of calmed down and then the children would come home. So this was the idea, right, that your children would be sent away, they would be safe during all this, you know, upheaval and then once everything calmed down, the children would come home, but that day never came. So, you know, um, Anna and, and her sister, my mother, basically were sent, you know, to um, Iowa, it's like a random, <laughs> because people, you know, the kids were sent all over the country or wherever they could be hosted. Uh, so they were sent to Iowa and they were very out of place. You know, I mean, Anna was, um, she was the darker of the two. Um, so she had dark skin and kind of, you know, very curly hair. And, you know, she's in Iowa, everyone has like blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, they didn't speak any English. So it was very hard, very hard transition, especially at that, you know, preteen, right at the brink of it, that age. Um, and it was, it, was, it was very hard for her, um, especially because she didn't understand, you know, she didn't really understand why she had been sent away. 
And so when she started work doing art, she said that art was like, basically she said art was like her saving grace. Like it was the only thing that made her sing, you know, that she could do something that made sense to her. Um, so when she did her, you know, when she started doing her Silhouette series and really talking about her work and talking about how, what the work meant, she always used this kind of similar language about the return to, to the motherland, the return to, you know, having been uprooted from her homeland. Um, so there was always that idea of, you know, looking for a place to belong, which is interesting because it's even more relevant today because all of us are uprooted. I mean, really all the time. I mean, who really just stays in one place? I mean, some people do, I guess, but I mean, most people, kind of move around a lot and families separate and there's it's just a very different today than how it you know used to be um especially in, in cuban culture you know it's like i mean when i go back to cuba it's like all the family they still all live in the same houses if the families are all together and they see each other all the time and there's this closeness that we just don't have in this country you know it's like it's it's a miracle to see each other on holidays sometimes you know so <laughs> So this was what she was working through her work, you know, and once her, um, her father was um, arrested because he was actually working against the Cuban government. So he was, he was working for the CIA. And so he was arrested. And um, so he spent like 20, you know, 20 plus years in, in prison. And so she, you know, she thought she would never be able to go back to Cuba. You know, it's kind of like they were in the United States, they were safe. That was just like a place that you come from, but you're never going to get to return to. Um, but once he was released, you know, that idea shifted. And her mother actually went to Cuba um, shortly thereafter to see her parents. And when she came back, you know, she told Anna, you really need to go back to Cuba. You need to see your grandparents and this will help, you know, the healing and being able to see everyone. And so Anna became possessed really to try and figure out how to get back. And you can see it in her letters to people and, you know, that she was, she was trying to figure it out, like, how could she get back to Cuba? And she did, she figured it out. And the first time she went, it was like an educational thing where they traveled around and they saw different um, cities and she was able to see the family. Um, but then she knew she had to go back and make work. Um, so the second trip, she actually um, made a piece in Varadero, which is uh, a small town uh, on the ocean where her grandmother had a house there that she grew up every, you know, every summer, every holiday, they spent time at this beach house. And she did a piece there. Um, she, she hadn't planned it. It wasn't like she went there planning to do a piece, but she, while she was there, she just knew she had to make her mark there. She had to create one of her forms there. And she made this beautiful, um, like kind of, they're, they're not really sculptures, you know, they're, they're kind of like paintings. They're like paintings on rock, you know? So she, she had access to paint and she basically found these shapes in, in the rock and she created these forms. And I think we have uh, an image of one um, that she called, um, this is one that, that predated that, that she did in Iowa called Black Venus, um, which is based on a Sibone, a legend of Sibone Indians of Cuba. And she took the same legend and the same idea and brought it to Cuba. So it's kind of like these two pieces are in dialogue with each other. It's like in Iowa where she found her voice as an artist. And then the first work she made in Cuba is also the Black Venus, La, um, La Venus Negra. No, that's not it. Oh, this is... Anna's film, I think. Yeah, we have a little fragment yeah. from okay. Anna's film. Yes, yeah, so this is a Super 8 film that Anna um, shot of the piece that she painted into this rock um, near the ocean in Baradero. And this was um, like a precursor to what she was going to do in Haruko. So once she did several of these pieces, it's like she knew, like, I have to come back and really make some pieces here. And it, you know, it's, it's, she wasn't sure. I mean, she talked about how she wasn't sure um, what it was gonna be like to go back and how was it gonna be to work there? Because, you know, she, she, bas she said that she was between two cultures, you know, because mm -hmm. like she wasn't really Cuban anymore and she wasn't really American. I mean, she was kind of in, in between, you know, like in the, in the middle. Um, so I think for her, doing these works in Haruko when she did these, you know, so many sculptures in Haruko was like, 
it was like a homecoming for her. You know, it's like, I, I think of it like as a love song, you know, it's kind of these beautiful pieces in the landscape. And when you go there and you see like the lushness of the landscape and, you know, and these hidden pieces in there, I mean, there's really like a, a magic, there is the magic in there. Like you can feel that energy in, in, in the caves. Um, and it's interesting because her work also shifted like at that after she made those pieces in Cuba That's when she started creating uh, more sculptural forms and started to work with actual sculptures So it was really a transition for her of you know making those works in Cuba um, When she came back to the United States in Miami, she made this piece This was actually the last moving image uh, work that she did. She it was shot on video and it was created in the waters of Key Biscayne and these two landforms are one one side points to Cuba and one to Miami, you know, to the United States. And it's kind of like this dialogue, you know, it's like for her, it was like the waters flowing between, you know, herself, her new home and her, her original home, you know, both her homes, but two different places, but connected the same because it's the same water. So. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Mira? Uh, so my mother's journey. Well, um, so I think from a young age, she knew she was going to leave Turkey. She wanted to be an artist. Um, she wanted to really be her free, fulfilled self and her place in her family and her place as a girl in the in the culture, even, you know, as a, the child of the New Republic. Um, she, it wasn't enough. Um, that she was either whether it was going to be Germany or the United States, she was going to go. So in '58, she came um, to New York to do her master's in painting, and um, I think the expectation was that she would return back to Istanbul after she was done. Um, but she met my sister's father, and so that didn't happen. She stayed, and there was a real—I mean, she spoke to them, but there she didn't go back to Turkey for 20 years. Uh, she was very busy during that time, um, first, you know, having my sister and then uh, after my, uh, after her father died, uh, meeting my father, starting our family and her career really took off right when I was a baby. So, um, but there, and there was a real rupture there with Turkey. And in the seventies here in New York, it's hard to imagine how different it was for her as an emigre. Um, I, it's really, I think everyone should just try to try to imagine it because I, I don't have the time to uh, share some of the anecdotes, but she was really perceived as a foreigner. She had heavily accented English. And um, anyway, so she stayed and she did become an artist and she did fulfill her ambition. Um, and it wasn't until the early 80s that we started to reconnect and go back um, to Turkey. Um, and I think it was it was an important part of her journey. She talked about the journey to the self, um, which is a hugely important task for a person who's, you know, reflective or an artist or both. Um, and she also spoke about being between cultures. When she started going back to Turkey, she was recognized as not from there. Um, her Turkish was old fashioned. Her body language became American. You know, she was a real. And then here same deal. So she, she spoke a lot about this duality and, and the later works in the 80s and 90s, she's working to reconcile that in her personal life and in the work. Um, and the Epic of Gilgamesh is a key part of that. Um, so in 1987, there's a trip where she uh, connects with the art world in Istanbul and she begins the relationships that were gonna carry her through the end of her life and probably would have continued on if she'd lived with Gallery Nev and Gallery Beme and um, producing work around the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, and also reconciling with the family and, you know, just coming home in a way, you know, she was in her mid fifties. And so by the mid nineties, um, she's producing work in Turkey. It's a whole new period that's happening for her um, and exhibiting there and in Philadelphia. So I think the relationship to Turkey was huge. She didn't talk about it. Um, I mean, she talked about it in, in the later years, but I think in the, it, it's, it was definitely something that kind of unfolded. And when she 
spent more time in the mid to late 90s in before moving back. Um, she did take journeys to the family hometown of Iskenderun, um, which is not far from the border with Syria, and it's not far from the land that historically was Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent. So I think that was part of her connection with um, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, and at that, that those last um, 15 years, um, the work is definitely in dialogue with these, these archetypes of duality and it's healing. And that was a personal and universal project for her. It's fascinating. It's really fascinating, like how different um, those two um, stories of leaving the homeland are. And then, you know, when Anna goes back, it's just one big embrace uh, because that's been the pain going on for 20 years of a child adolescent and then grown up woman. And for Bilge, um, because it was her own choice, right? She, she, she voluntarily em em emigrated. She, could, she had this luxury of like going, taking the apples of Gilgamesh and actually uh, criticizing the patriarchal religion. You know, I, I thought it's, it's fascinating because the, they both go back to the myth that is like the founding myth of the place and do something entirely different with that myth. And of course, there is a whole story of an and star and woman empowerment, but mm. we want to leave something for the future. <laughs> Patience. There's a lot. Let me ask my last question and the audience in the meantime can start thinking of their questions. We will have Q&A uh, after, after we go through this segment. And that's a very important uh, layer of this conversation for me because you're not just channeling your, your close ones. You are artists and people in yourself uh, with your own emotions and your, your own ambitions and plans and life. And um, carrying this legacy is an emo enormous thing. And I guess it's just very interesting to talk about this a little bit. Uh, it is especially interesting for me because my whole interest, I think current interest in feminism uh, comes from the perspective of trying to make sure that we build that legacy. Um, I simply know that they were very successful commercially, uh, uh, successful women in 19th century who were painters and that these works uh, or their words are usually not passed down to posteriority, we don't know them because okay, maybe they sold a few paintings, but nobody took care to write them down into history of art. And uh, we've observed this generation after generation, and I'm very keen on making sure that we preserve it and then the next generation can make their um, story available for women who come later on. And you played a very important role uh, for the legacy of these two artists. And there are a lot of um, amazing moments that even I could see in, in the movie, um, in the film that you made, Raquel, there is this scene after the initial excitement about finding the, the site and everybody shouting. And there, there is a moment of, of almost silence when you say, I don't want to leave. And it's, it's very, um, it's quite powerful. And I had moments like this with uh, Mira as well during the pandemic, we could not see each other. So we would be over Zoom and Mira would open for me the boxes uh, with her mother's diaries. And we would try to read the 19, late 1980s that would refer to Gilgamesh and find more um, ideas about this work, what she had in mind. And you know, it was moving, but he also did it with other curators before with her body of work uh, uh, from 1970s. And you also did it as, as an artist to begin with, as a conceptual artist. And I would like you to now talk about yourself and what those personal journeys meant for you, maybe also travels that you had to do to uh, Istanbul and to uh, Havana uh, and beyond and how they, how, how what, what, this, what the journey is for you? So I, my mother was really, you know, she's the one who made sure that Anna would be remembered. You know, it's like once her sister was gone, she just made that her full-time job. She put all her focus and all her time in just trying to let people know about Anna's work. 
And she was lucky enough to find somebody like Mary Sabatino at Gallery of the Long, who also believed in the work. And the two of them really just, you know, they're the, they're it really it's because of the, their vision that they, you know, what, how they saw and understood Anna's work and what she was trying to do, you know, and let it have, you know, let it be seen. So when I came onto the scene, um, you know, I'm a filmmaker and I was doing my own thing. And um, that's when they started uh, showing some of her films. And at the time we were showing things on video. And because I was a filmmaker, you know, I was starting to get the questions of like, hey, should we do this? Should we do that? And so then I'd put in my two cents. No, you shouldn't do this. You should do that. And oh, I'll help you with this. And, you know, and so little by little, I started getting more involved because of, you know, because of the film works. Um, and and I always said, I'm never doing that job. Like, <laughs> you know, because it's like, I could see my mom, like she sacrificed so much. I mean, she's an artist herself and she sacrificed really her own career, you know, to, to make sure that Anna's work was, was known. And I, I just didn't want to do that. I was like, no way, I'm, an, I'm a filmmaker. I have my own movies to make. I don't have time for that, um, but I'll help you, you know, on the side. So, <laughs> Um, but when my mother became very ill, um, you know, I, I knew I had to step in, you know, it's like I had to come and help her. And I, I felt like this is just a short term thing. I'll come and help until she kind of gets better or we'll figure it out. And, you know, little, little at a time, it's like Anna was pulling me. Nope, you're, you're in for this, you know. And um, so, I mean, it was, it was very slow that I really didn't see it happening until I was like fully immersed in it. And I was like, oh, I guess I am doing this job now, you know, <laughs> like, but, but it was okay because, um, I mean, there's so, there's so many blessings in it and I felt such a deep connection to Anna. I mean, I always, you know, admired her. She was my aunt, she was my godmother. She was, she's, I mean, she was an amazing person. She was just like the kind of person you always wanted to be around because, you know, she just had a lot of, you know, energy and she was just like that you know very um charismatic so working you know with her archive and working you know looking at her films and really getting you know steeped into it it was it was almost like addicting you know it's like i would find these little clues and go on these right down these rabbit holes and try and figure something out and um and that's when i started making these these films you know because i was like i have to do something with this i'm gonna make a movie so i'm gonna make this little film over here and then i'm gonna make that little film over there you know um which is great because then i felt like i could still do my work as a filmmaker but yet i could also still help you know on a you know continue her legacy and and continue that work as well so it was satisfying on both ends um and so the the film that I did with Spring Cave was really, I mean, I had no intention of making that film. I'm, I'm, I'm working on a feature length documentary actually about Anna that's been like this huge long project that's finally coming to an end. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so I was really working on that, but then, you know, I had been traveling to Cuba um, and to visit family and just for different reasons. I had another film that had played at the Havana Film Festival. And um, so on one of these trips was when I, you know, when we went to Haruko and I saw, you know, we saw the caves, the, the works at the Bacayu, we saw the Bacayu and Maroya and all those other works. And that's when I noticed um, the landscape, you know, and I saw you know, the clue that the other site might, might be right there because it had been written about it was somewhere completely different in the park and no one really knew where it was. And I was convinced it was like right there, like right next to this one. Um, so it took me two years to, to come back and, um, and I decided that, you know, hey, I'm just going to shoot some film because that's what I do. Is, and everywhere you go, you've got to shoot some film or video and maybe you'll have a project, you know. And really, Anna was leading the way for me. You know, it's like she was um, the clues again about, you know, look over here, do this, follow that. And it was like following my own instinct, you know, like kind of when you're really tapped into it it's it's just it's natural you know it comes to you it's like you're not thinking about it you're not planning it you just kind of follow your instinct and and you you land where you're supposed to be so that's the moment that you're you're talking about in in the film was really like i mean it wasn't really the first time that i felt that way because i remember that also happened uh, at a, the retrospective that we had uh, traces when it ended in in prague you know i was i kept going to the museum and looking at the the tree trunks that she did you know she did these beautiful um carvings on these trunks called la hongla and it was it was a series that she was doing it was meant to be this installation in a park in los angeles at echo park that um that never came to fruition because of her death but so i was at this exhibition and 
I kept not wanting to leave the museum. Like I kept finding an excuse to go back. And, and I, I had that same feeling because it's like when you're looking at the work and you're, it's like the works have this energy, you know, especially the sculptures and just some of some specific works. They just have this feeling and this energy that you don't want to part from it because it's just so magical. And for me, it's a closeness, you know, it's like I can feel that connection and that, that closeness to her. Um, so really like in a way for me, it was also like my own homecoming, you know, in that moment, because it's like, I felt like I had found what I'd been searching for, but it wasn't really just the works. It wasn't really just reconnecting with Anna. It was like a part of me that also had been lost because, you know, I'm also, even though I'm, you know, I am American, you know, I don't consider myself just American. I was raised by, you know, my mother who's Cuban and very, you know, very strong women. And um, I just, you know, when I, the first time I traveled to Cuba in 2000, I felt that, like, I felt like, oh, I get it. That's why I'm like this, because I'm like them. You know, that's so weird. Like, how can I be like this when I'm not even like, I don't even know these people, you know? So it, it's all like this circle, like this connectedness. It's just amazing. So I, I, I think that answers your question. I don't know. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, did we show the images? We did a little bit yeah, from Bakayu. Yeah, only Bakayu. Tyler, let's show all of them. We have uh, we have three oh, pairs is, of um, images where you can right. see this. Um, you can you can talk about the Raquel. Right. So this is Bakayu when the first time that I went back, and you can see the difference if you want to go back to the previous image, which is this one. Yeah. So this is Anna's photograph of Bakayu when she created it in 1981. And then the next image is, here it is in 2015, still there. You can still see the outlines, the shape. Uh, I mean, it's amazing, you know, like when you, when you see it, it's, I mean, she didn't intend for that, you know, she, she never intended for these pieces to endure. She, you know, the, the work is the photographs, the work is, you know, the film, but they're still there. So the, the traces of them, you know, it's beautiful. Tyler, can you show us the next one? Yeah. Yeah, so this one is really interesting because Maroya, on the left is Anna's image and on the right is the image I took in 2015. And I mean, they look almost the same. So it's, you know, somehow it really hasn't evolved that much through time. And the next one? Yeah. This is Kakubu, which is um, another one at the same, these are all from the same site from the one with the hard limestone. So you can see how she's, very, you know, like here she's kind of scratching into the, into the rock to kind of make that shape. But she took the two little brown, you know, the little black spots there um, and then incorporated the shape around it. Can we see the next one, Tyler? Yeah. And this is in 2015. So you can still see that outline. It's, 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 very, it's, it's quite amazing to see both. Let's leave it for the discussion. I'm sure people will be asking about this. And let's go back to Mira and, and her own personal journey. Sure. Well, um, yes, you know, I've so many thoughts. I mean, as anyone in this work knows, the archive is never finished. So that box that we opened together in March over Zoom, you know, it was lost in the archive for, for years. But then it kind of came on under my hand um, while I was doing the research to respond to Monica. So my story with Bilge's work, uh, so she died in 2000 and just my journey. She died in 2000 and um, there was no plan for the work. Uh, there was no plan for representation for her after death. Um, so, and the work was already in storage in America. So, um, so the work sat for a very long time. Um, and then, and the, in Philadelphia, and then uh, we just didn't know what to do with it. So, uh, time passed and, uh, could you go back, Tyler? <laughs> so <laughs> I just don't, so I want to speak a little bit about how I started doing my work with the objects. But first, we got to sit on that black and white slide for a while. So basically, that was the state of the, the work for a very long time. And some of these objects had been in storage since the 70s, since the 80s. They've been moved slowly towards me in Brooklyn. 
And in 2011, my mother was included in a show at the Istanbul Modern of uh, women artists from Turkey and called Dream and Reality. And so I had to pull something and I didn't have an inventory. I just had these lists and there's the work I knew from my own life, which coincidentally is the Epic of Gilgamesh prints. So I went into this 10 by 10 storage space and I tried to figure out what I was gonna send these curators because there was no system, no list, you know, she was too busy making her work to, to keep good organization. So I had this epiphany in this space um, of experiencing this 10 by 10 storage and everything inside it as this monolithic sculpture that only I had the access to, only I was able to see it. And I was very aware of all the stored objects all around me and all the stored art all over the world because um, there's just, you know, there's too much of it. Um, and at the time I was working as exhibition manager and an artist's assistant. So I'm working in the backstage of the art world. I'm very deeply, you know, I'm inspired by the creativity that goes on there. And I feel like, you know, that's something I wanted to bring into the front room. And my experience of these boxes just made me want to do, and I was doing more and more non-objective work, more performance at the time myself. So I had the idea to take this storage rack, bring it to the front, bring it to a gallery and start uh, working with the objects. Tyler, now, please, uh, you may go forward. So before I opened anything, and I mean, anybody who deals with estates will understand how crazy and backwards this is because I had never opened any of these boxes. I didn't know what was inside them. But as an artist, I was really excited about the them. So I did, I created assemblages, I did performances with these objects, um, really just thinking about them as stored objects and what, what meaning they have when they're not being seen and nobody knows what's inside them. Um, so I did this for a couple of years and then um, I heard about Recess, uh, which is now in Brooklyn, but at the time they were in uh, Soho. With, and they're a wonderful, um, nonprofit that gives public facing residencies to artists. I think you can go forward, Tyler. Um, and so in 24, I applied for one of these residencies and in 2014, I, for six weeks, I enacted half of what's there, which was a kind of endurance important a performance of unpacking, installing, registering, having a reception, repacking the work and repeating. Um, just curating by box, whatever they were packed with was what got hung up. And just to make a, um, let's pause here, uh, just to make a compressed uh, exhibition cycle really. Um, so I did bring half of the stored objects into the space and then we did do these performative unpackings with, um, this one was with a Chelsea preparator and a museum registrar who came and we just, we unpacked something that hadn't been opened, I think for 40 years. So this was my work, you know, these converse, the conversations, the actions that happened in this period. Um, it wasn't really about my relationship with my mom, but I guess just discovering these objects and processing them. Um, I'm not sure what the next slide is, but let's see. it. We go to our chair probably. Yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs> so, so yes, so the conversations at recess, there were many, and they led me to reconnect with people in Istanbul who did remember my mom, and that led to an invitation to do a solo show at Arter, which is one of the preeminent institutions in Istanbul. Um, they now have uh, built a museum, but at the time they were in uh, Beolo in a nice kunst hall. So we co-curated this with Ishan Onol, and we, we focused on the works that I had discovered during recess, which I had not known during my mother's life, which was the 70s into the early 80s, 1975 to 83. And we can go forward. And we focused on these because this is where Bilge found her voice and really had her moment, the beginning of her moment as an artist with these works that investigate the torn line, the horizontal line, and our connection and perception of nature and reality. Um, so, so that was uh, incredible. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So that was, and so at the end of, so those works in the last slide are more of the early seventies minimalist and post minimalist works. 
And then these works are from 79 and 83. And these are the works that you see. She's beginning to work with natural materials. She's beginning to be more overt in her dialogue with nature. It's not as um, conceptual. It's becoming earthier. And there's actually sand in those. Um, that's Riverhouse book in the front. You know, there's sand, there's handmade paper, there's bamboo, and there's river rocks. So, um, so this journey is about understanding my mom's life and developing a new field of scholarship for myself. I think we can go forward because it really, after a certain point, once the work has been opened, I'm not doing exactly an art project when I'm curating a show or when I'm acting as the director of the estate, which is a very different hat. But what it's given me is you know this insight into a whole world of artists the states and the scholarship and the work that goes on there um, which i'm part of um, so i relate a lot to what raquel has said about just you know you think you're just gonna go in and then it continues <laughs> Never but it's uh, but it's also and it's a gift also sometimes it's very heavy but it's wonderful to be in dialogue with her work and you know it's some of the best it's the best of her you know yeah, so, and we, we get have to questions hear. coming from the audience. We okay. of course invaded our Q and A space, but I did it on purpose. Sometimes the conversations go slower. Sometimes they. I really enjoyed how we involve, you know, developed it in time, and I didn't want to break it. Uh, we have a few questions. Two of them sort of come back to back as the same question, but they are really asked so differently. One of them reads, did either of those artists see themselves as practicing shamanism? And the other um, speaks about transformation and healing. And uh, the person who asked this question uh, wrote, uh, maybe there is more you can say about their arrivals at that recognition of the need to heal, inner and outer, about their ideas about the interconnection of art and transformation, healing. And those questions are very different, but I think it's a point of perspective. I can definitely speak to that. So, um, so I, I, my, my, I just read a text uh, from, that was in the files uh, where my mom is talking about uh, lecture, you know, basically a participatory ritual conversation. It was a lecture, but she wanted to frame it as a ritual with with the audience. And I think um, you're right on the money with with her in that she wanted to find to combine all these things: art and ritual, the universe and the self. And I think if she had lived, uh, she died when she was 65, and I think if she had lived 20 more years, she may very well have gone further down that path of, you know, investigating shamanism. I don't think, it was more just, you know, she had a real spiritual connection with nature um, in a very deep way. And um, the way she was, I think her need to heal, you know, we all go through, you know, things happen, life happens, and, um, I just, she was a seeker. She was always trying to find her way forward philosophically and spiritually. So I think um, the personal need to heal, she really connected it and she connected her work and the way she uh, used a line or a piece of paper. It was about being internal and one and external and universal. So combining those dualities was a thing she worked on from the seventies until the end of her life. Raquel? Shamanism. So I don't think, I mean, Anna was definitely interested in that kind of thing. Um, I mean, she had her palm read, she had her astrological chart done. She actually went to see Bapalao when she was in Cuba. Um, so, she, But she herself didn't, I don't think that she felt like she was that or, I mean, I, I think more that she felt like she was, um, connecting with nature, like in that moment when you're creating a work and you're in tune with the work, it's, it's like a state of meditation. So it's, it's like, it's a state of meditation. It's like you are, you are connected with everything, with the universe and with nature. Um, so it's kind of a different level in my mind anyway. It's like, I know shamanism can mean different things, but it's, that's very specific. So I don't think for Anna that it would be that in that, you know, vocabulary, I guess you could say. 
um, as far as healing, I mean, she was aware that her work was um, connecting her and like healing her internally, but she didn't want, that's not what the purpose of the work was on a bigger, like she wanted to have a larger meaning in the, in the larger context of things. Like she didn't want it to become like this kind of psychological, like I'm doing this healing project. You know, it wasn't for her, it was much larger, a much bigger idea. So it's, that's again, it's kind of like a, and, and word choice, you know, it's kind of interesting. And she actually talks about that, like that she didn't want it to, to come off as being like, you know, she was trying to like do psychoanalysis or something by doing her work. It's like she did her work because she had to do her work. She was an artist and she had to create, right? So it's a little bit different. Um, there are two more questions to Raquel. One of them is also my question, which I very much wanted to raise. Um, about the conservation. We spoke a lot about those artists, you know, idea of, of, of having these works um, in nature and maybe not leaving the trace, but then you go and you find them and are they protected by the state of Cuba or what are the plans for this? Yes, it is a really interesting conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, when Anna made those pieces, she didn't intend for them to endure, right? Because all the works that she did up until that time really were in the landscape and then nature would reabsorb them, you know, with rain or whatever, um, whether um, even, even site specific pieces, like she was doing uh, public art, she would sometimes do pieces, but even those, they were not meant to endure. Um, but when you're doing something in a rock, you know, it's kind of like, it might still be there. So, in, you know, after her death and for many years afterwards, we never really, some people had come to us and talked about, you know, should we put a plaque there? Should we do this? Should we try it? And we thought, no, we shouldn't because that wasn't her intention. Like, you know, she wasn't really intending for this to be like a place where people go and see these works. But through time, I feel like I've shifted with that idea just because people do go there and people do. And, and, I, and I know of certain instances where people have disrespected you know, not that they've done it intentionally, um, but I mean, I would like for something to be done to preserve the, to preserve the site is, you know, as much, not without touching it, without, you know, just letting it be what it's meant to be, which is just absorbing back to nature, you know, the way it's meant to, and not by other people trampling around on it and, and whatever. Um, so we actually were um, talking with the Cuban government and trying to figure out how, how we could do that, what that might look like. And it's a very long process, of course, you know, of course, our political current situation here in Cuba. So it's, you know, we'll see if anything will progress with that. But I mean, that I, I would love that. I mean, I would love for something to be put in place, you know, because people need to be aware that, you know, it is, um, I mean, it's her work, you know, it's like, this is an artist's work. And even though she meant for it to be, you know, disappear and reabsorb into nature, it's, it is still there. So it needs to be treated you know, like a work, so. Um, uh, Mira, could you actually, uh, before we go to the next question, could you actually, um, there is something very important that we touched here that is the artist's intention, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that this is one of the most challenging things when you are left with a legacy like that because certain things you know, mm -hmm and certain things you project or you guess. And could you also speak to that, how you try to decipher intention on the part of your mother and? Sure. Well, I, we're so incredibly lucky because um, when we did the work for the Arts Hour show, so guess what? Reading my mother's journals was not high on my list in, as a person. So it's something I, I knew they were there, but I could not bear to, I would look at them and I would shut them. So um, working in collaboration, I was able to read them and discover the wealth of, you know, she's speaking about her work philosophically. She's incredibly clear. She's incredibly um, articulate. It's they're incredible they're incredible so there it's it, the the way she writes about her work is so coherent um and we've just started to this box of journals from the 80s which i really had we had labeled mislabeled it so it was lost inside this storage um it's still waiting to be completely delved into but it's um 
she did record it. She didn't leave great records about, you know, her exhibitions or her slides, but she did leave fantastic uh, philosophical thoughts and about her work, about life, about existence, and they connect and expand our understanding of the work. Um, so that's fanta a fantastic thing, which continues to be discovered. This is the part of the archive that just blows my mind that um, you can you can think you've inventoried it a, a hundred times, but there's often something new and things are always coming back into it. Right. That's a it's quite a kind of an important point, I guess, if there are artists listening to us, I mean, write your own story. Uh, and yeah. actually a question comes from an artist who, who is right now writing the book about her work, Aviva Rahmani, who's also an artist in the exhibition. And he's a, he has a, she has a question about Anna Mendieta. Uh, I never noticed before, but in Imahen uh, the Yagul, uh, it looks like Anna is covered by baby's breath. Is that correct? And if it, if it is, I wonder whether the languaging implications might have been important to her and you know the connection to the idea of motherhood and uh, bearing children do you know anything about that Raquel? I don't think I mean there she's in Mexico and I don't think they're I don't think that's the flower I mean it does look like that I think it's more you know she said that she bought the flowers at the market so she went to the market and she saw these flowers and she bought the flowers knowing she was going to do something with them you know at, at this site um, so I don't think they're I mean I don't even know do they have baby's breath in Mexico um, <laughs> I actually tried to research it and trying to find out exactly the type of flower and um, it's interesting because in the photo they look tinier than I think they actually are because when I started doing you know research on I mean these are the kind of random rabbit holes I go down like I wonder what kind of flower those are let me like google it and look at all these flowers in Mexico <laughs> um, I forget what they were called but they they're a little bit bigger than actual baby's breath so I don't think that's I think that they, to her, they look like wildflowers. Like her idea was that, you know, like if you go to ancient sites, like even like, you know, to the Colosseum in Rome or to any of these types of places, you'll see, you know, little shoots of things growing up between these ancient rock. And you just, it's just amazing that like nature is just shoving its way through something that man built. You know, I think she just really loved that idea of like, that nature is just gonna come and overtake all of us one day. It's like, we're only here for a short time. And you, we have to remember that because it's like, you know, we think that everything we're doing right now was so important and that we're here forever and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, we're not. It's like nature is the end all, you know, and it's like nature's going to win in the end. You know, we're trying to destroy it. It'll still win one way or another. So it's like that's really, you know, the idea behind that. It's a beautiful, there's a beautiful way to end it. There is uh, one uh, more question that is more to me which is too complicated for me to answer, but I will use it as a wrap up. Um, the question is about spirituality and my involvement, my, my scholar involvement with it. And I have to tell you all that I didn't, uh, when I was jumping into this subject, uh, I didn't think of spirituality at all. And when I encountered this enormous literature of goddess art, I was basically going to keep it where it was, a little bit under the, the carpet and move into much more contemporary uh, issues like environmental justice, this and that. And it just didn't want to happen. It was just so obvious that we need to go back to the beginning and understand what these women were looking for and why, and what informed their specific feminist vision of eco ecology, no matter that ours today may be different, no matter that there are other perspectives, and there are many, on ecology and ecological art. So, and I think that it was a, also kind of a wake up call for me. Um, when I was forced to think about spirituality in art, I just realized that in modernity we censored spirituality. And I just think of how, you know, um, Alma of, of Klimt, uh, Klimt was introduced when Guggenheim showed her show. She was like, first we heard about those, this unknown to be uh, rediscovered uh, now, um, forgotten abstract painter. And then only we realized that it's not just geometric abstraction. It's a spiritual, she's a spiritual artist. And that it can't just be extracted from her art. And this was, and I immediately uh, connected those two. And I thought, um, 
even if I didn't think it was my vocation to deal in this, it, it's just, it was, it's just there. I mean, my responsibility as a scholar is just try to understand what's there and what it means and what it meant there, no matter what my position would be. And it's extremely illuminating. I, it's completely changed my thinking of early feminism. And it's a, it's the research project. So we will see where it, where it, uh, where it goes. Uh, and I hope it goes somewhere. I hope we can all be inspired by this exhibition. And of course, we know how timely it is and, and, what, and how sad it is that it is timely. So um, thank you all for participating in these conversations. Uh, again, if you have time, please come to the gallery if you think it's proper for you. If you'd rather stay at home, uh, engage with the materials online, you know how to find either me or Thomas Urban uh, to engage in further conversations, scholarship, or about the artists and their works. And also, if you can do anything in your life to live less toxic and leave less of a, of a footprint, I don't want to forget that this is what this whole exhibition is about. So let it be our motto. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Raquel. Uh, thank you, thank you Mira. Uh, thank you to thank the you, Gallery and to Thomas. Have a good night. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you.